Hello, my name is Gabrielle. Um, a lot of you might know me from Twitter. That's where I spend most of my time. Um, Gab smash on there. So my presentation today is called Outbreak Virus versus Virus, how we can apply current legislation and handling of the COVID-19 pandemic to the spread of malware. All right, so usually the first question I get is, who are you and why do you feel like you're qualified to give this talk? Um, so I am a graduate of the University of Cincinnati where I studied neuroscience and psychology. I started my career in pharmaceutical development and regulatory compliance, and then I led special committees targeting phase one, infectious disease and emergency research. I still serve on a board as a regulatory and genetic science consultant for NIH studies utilizing recombinant DNA, synthetic nucleic acid molecules and genetic engineering. Moved to cybersecurity in 2018, and I work as a cloud security engineer in healthcare, and I've also worked as a pen tester as well, so. And this meme, like, I put it in here a long time ago, and I think it's getting more relevant as the year goes on, which is not a good thing, but at least we have funny internet pictures at the end of the day. All right, so first let's talk about pandemics. Most people don't know the difference between outbreaks, epidemics, and pandemics, so I will explain that to you. An outbreak is when there's a greater than anticipated increase in the number of endemic cases of something. Endemic cases are something that happens to a particular people or country. It can also be a single case in a new area. For example, one time this entire family in West Virginia got norovirus gastroenteritis at a family reunion. Supposedly, there were two different strains caused by two different dishes, so grandma's cooking skills apparently run strongly in the family. Anyway, this is what an outbreak is. An epidemic is when a disease affects a large number of people within a community, population, or region. The Zika virus could be considered an epidemic because it affected a large number of people, but it wasn't globally widespread. A pandemic is an epidemic that spreads over multiple countries or continents. That would be what we're going through right now. So COVID-19 was declared to be a pandemic. I'm not sure if this map means updating. I don't remember specifically what parts of Africa were affected, um, but I know that most, most of the world has been at this point, so. All right, so first let's look at a history of pandemics, see if we see any trends. So first we have the Antonin Plague. It was a pandemic that broke out around 165 AD and it was either smallpox or measles, nobody's really sure. And it was brought to Rome by soldiers returning from Mesopotamia. It killed roughly 5 million people. The Plague of Justinian happened in 541 and 542. This was the bubonic plague and it killed 25 million people. It's thought to have off half of the population of Europe at the time. The Black Death was also the bubonic plague. Not sure how many people it killed exactly, but between 75 and 200 million. It was spread, spread via fleas and rats. The third cholera pandemic occurred between 1852 and 1860, and it was found to be due to contaminated water. It killed around a million people. The flu pandemic in 1889 was a subtype of H3N8. It killed over 1 million people. The sixth cholera pandemic occurred in 1910 and killed roughly 800,000 people. Because the US had learned from the past, they were able to isolate the infected and only 11 deaths occurred here. The 1918 flu pandemic was an oddly deadly flu virus with a mortality rate of 10 to 20%. It killed between 20 and 50 million people. And that has been one of the pandemics that, you know, the current COVID pandemic has been most compared to. The Asian flu and H2N2 subtype took out roughly 2 million people between 1956 and 1958. The 1968 flu pandemic was an H3N2 subtype and it took only 17 days to spread across Asia and three months to reach worldwide. It killed roughly 1 million people. And finally, the peak of the HIV AIDS pandemic was from 2005 to 2012. While now manageable with treatment, it took over 36 million lives since 1981. All right, so looking at all these, we can ascertain a couple of things. One, a main concern is containing the spread of a virus, especially between continents. 
It's a skill we have not yet mastered. We also have learned that many of the recurring infections are mutations. These are very common among viruses. Oftentimes, viruses are made of RNA and not DNA, and therefore they are less stable and they're more prone to making mistakes. Because they don't have a proofreading step at the end of their replication, the mistakes often lead to a mutation. Finally, we see a lot of repetitiveness. There are certain strains that are hardier and can easily become recurrent. All right, now let's talk about cyber attacks. So um, I'm assuming that pretty much everyone here knows what malware is, but just in case you don't, malware is malicious software. It is basically an umbrella term to de describe malicious programs or code that are harmful to systems. It's like a termite. It tries to invade, damage, or disable systems, networks, etc. Malware can be like a vi biological virus in that it interferes with regular functioning of a system. Malware is spread in a few ways. One of the most common is via email, people clicking on things that they shouldn't. Attackers can be super good at making things look like they're coming from legitimate senders. There are also types of malware that exploit system vulnerabilities, causing users to inadvertently put malware on their machine. It can also be spread directly, spread directly like via USB. Here is the Emotet infection chain. This is a super nasty type of malware that's been around for a while, and it's usually exploited by links to malicious Word documents or by attached malicious Word documents. All right, so in contrast to the worst pandemic viruses, here are some of the worst malware and or massive data breaches that have stuck, struck around the world. First, we have Stuxnet which was created by the US government in Israel. Uh, the worm was used in 2010, was the first malware to physically damage equipment. Um, the worm targeted Microsoft Windows and then located Siemens Step 7 in order to manipulate PLCs. Shamoon was developed by Iranian state-backed hackers. The Windows wiper was used in 2012 in an attack against oil company Saudi Aramco and works by collecting a computer's data before wiping and destroying the master boot record, effectively breaking the computer. The malware resurfaced in 2017 and 2018. The Sony hack uh, was supported by the North Korean government, a group calling themselves Guardians of Peace, attacked Sony Pictures Entertainment in 2014, stealing 100 terabytes of data, uh, deleting files and configurations, and later releasing the stolen sensitive information including employee information like social security numbers. Um, the OPM breach was a really big one. It was a series of breaches orchestrated by China in 2013 and 2014 against the Office of Personnel Management, which stores sensitive data about all past and present federal employees. In 2013, the hackers entered the OPM network to collect its blueprints. Then in 2014, they entered it again to gain control of the administrative server and stole employee information and information about other US citizens um, through 2015 when the OPM became aware of the situation. The Ukrainian blackouts were spearheaded by Russia as part of its physical war against Ukraine. Um, the first attack occurred in 2015 as a suite of malware that stole credentials, allowing the hackers to gain access and manually turn off circuit breakers, which caused a massive blackout. The second attack in 2016 was against a single transmission station targeted by an evolved malware known as Crash Override or In Destroyer. This malware allowed the hackers to manipulate control systems, but a technical mistake didn't allow for the intended physical equipment destruction. So that was lucky. Shadow Brokers. After resurfacing in 2016, the Shadow Brokers hacker group released an extensive collection of the National Security Agency's tools, including the Microsoft Windows exploit Eternal Blue in 2017. Eternal Blue then branched into the WannaCry malware, which, used, uh, which was built by North Korean hackers and was used to attack public utilities and large corporations worldwide. The 2016 US presidential hack, uh, two groups of Russian hackers, APT28 or Fancy Bear and APT20 or Cozy Bear ran social media disinformation campaigns along with email phishing attacks to breach the Democratic National Committee and release information via WikiLeaks. Um, 
I know a lot of us are really trying to make sure that something like that doesn't happen this year. We will see. NotPetya was developed by Russian hacking group Sandworm. It was a destructive malware built to lock down computers, devastate networks, and create chaos. Um, the malware spread around the world, eventually coming back to infect systems in Russia itself, and it disrupted a lot of companies and sectors, uh, including pharmaceutical, shipping, power, public transit, and more. Equifax, this well-known data breach in 2017 exposed personal information of nearly half of the U.S. population. Due to the company's handling of the breach, the situation only got worse, as phishing attacks and imposter sites asked for people's personal information, which is how the company itself was relaying to individuals whether their information had been compromised. Equifax is only one example of corporate data breaches in the 2010s, which also included the Target data breach, Home Depot breach, and the Ashley Madison data breach. Finally, we have Adhar. In 2018 alone, it's estimated at 1.1 billion Adhar numbers of associated data were breached and shared on the black market. Adhar is the Indian government's identification database and is used in everything from opening a bank account to signing up for utilities or a cell phone. Due to all the connections, data has been exposed by third parties or the government itself improperly sorting data. All right, so now that I have bored you with those long descriptions, we can talk about the similarities between some of these. All right, most of you are probably familiar with the life cycle of a computer virus, so I want to bring you up to speed on the life cycle of a human virus. There are generally four stages on the human virus, entry, replication, shedding, and latency. During entry, a virus must enter cells of the host organism and use these cells materials much like a computer virus needs a host. Next, a virus must take control of the host cell's replication mechanisms. It's at this stage a distinction between susceptibility and permissibility of a host cell is made. Permissibility determines the outcome of the infection. After control is established and the environment is set for the virus to begin making copies of itself, replication occurs usually very quickly by the millions. After a virus has made many copies of itself, the progeny may begin to leave the cell by several methods. This is called shedding and is the final stage in the viral life cycle. Some viruses can hide within a cell, which means that they may ev uh, evade the host cell defenses or immune system and may increase the long-term success of the virus. This hiding is deemed latency. Um, during this time, the virus does not produce any progeny. It remains inactive until external stimuli, such as light or stress, prompts it to activate. All right, so now we can compare the life cycles. During the entry phase for the biological virus, the virus enters cells of the host organism and uses the cell material. Similarly, with the computer virus, it has access target users, computer, or software. During replication, they both take control of the replication mechanism and begin to propagate. During the shedding phase, the biological virus leaves the cell or host while the computer virus is triggered and executed, potentially spreading. Finally, they both have latency periods where the virus can remain idle or hide. There are other similarities as well. Computer viruses target specific entities as do biological viruses when they seek out host cells. They both technically contain executable code. Um, the biological virus has genetic code that can be transcribed and translated. They both have specificity for what they target, i.e. an operating system versus a species. And finally, they have different degrees of harmfulness or virulence. All right, so from that life cycle, we can do vector analysis. You know how we do vector analysis with attacks, but did you know we use vectors with viruses as well? In the biological sciences, a vector is anything that can pass an infection to another organism. Here we have a diagram of some of the good ways that we use vectors. We remove cells from a patient, then alter a virus so that it cannot reproduce. We insert a gene into the virus, then grow similar cells that are also genetically altered. The altered cells are injected into the patient and produce the desired protein or hormone. This is used often in cancer treatment, et cetera.
Similarly, when we're talking about malware, um, a vector is the method that the code uses to propagate itself or infect a computer. When we look at the spread of a pandemic, we use a lot of maps to visualize data and the location of the spread of the disease. There are some companies that offer live data, but it does bring about the question of why we don't map malware spread the same way that we do pandemic spread. With the current virus, we've seen a lot of open source and live data sets that are available. This is pretty unprecedented. Um, we haven't had the technology to do this in the past when we've had pandemic level you know, spread of viruses. More data collection is being done with the prevalence of malware in innocuous looking apps. Um, however, there's still a pretty big shortage of data analysis surrounding malware campaigns. With pandemic spread, there are dedicated entities. Um, I'm sure you are so sick of hearing about the CDC, but the CDC and WHO, among others, that have specific units and um, teams, entire teams that are dedicated to continued monitoring of pandemic and outbreak spread. This provides constant information on the spread and handling of a pandemic. And again, with malware spread, there are a lot of tools for monitoring current attacks by private companies, but is there a case to be made for watchdog and spread monitoring on a government or even worldwide level? And that brings us to pandemic responses. So the national pandemic strategy is comprised of three pillars. The first pillar is preparedness and communication. This is the epitome of planning for a pandemic. The governing body will set community expectations and assign responsibilities, produce and stockpile vaccines, antivirals, or treatments, establish distribution plans for these treatments, and continue to advance scientific knowledge and accelerate the development of breakthroughs and other novel treatments. The second pillar is surveillance and detection. This should sound super familiar. This pillar focuses on ensuring rapid reporting of outbreaks to both public health entities and citizens and using surveillance to limit the spread of a virus. Finally, the third pillar is response and containment. This focuses on containing outbreaks, leveraging national medical and public health surge capacity, uh, sustaining infrastructure, essential services, and the economy, and ensuring effective, consistent risk communication. So this is just a, I, th I thought it was kind of an interesting chart that compared the World Health Organization phases with the federal government response phases. There's a little bit of a difference um, when it comes to some of the action that's taken. All right, so now we're gonna talk about malware and data breach response. So the National Cyber Incident Response Plan describes a national approach to dealing with cyber incidents, addresses the important role that the private sector, state and local governments, and multiple federal agencies play in responding to incidents and how the actions of all fit together for an integrated response. Um, this is built off of lessons from exercises, real world happenings, and policy updates like the National Cybersecurity Protection Act of 2014. This plan also serves as the cyber annex to the federal interagency operational plan that built upon the national planning frameworks and the national preparedness system. It applies to cyber incidents and more specifically significant cyber incidents that are likely to result in um, demonstrable harm to the national security interests, foreign relations or economy of the United States or to the public competence, civil liberties or public health and safety of the American people. The plan has five guiding principles. These are shared responsibility, risk-based response, respecting affected entities, unity of governmental effort, and enabling restoration and recovery. The NCIRP does have a relationship with the National Preparedness System, which covers a broader architecture that establishes how the community is to prevent protect against, mitigate, respond to, and recover from all threats and hazards. 
When we further break down the capabilities of an affected entity, we see more specific efforts that cover a broad range of activities. All right, so finally we can put it all together. Let's take a look at the current situation that we're dealing with. I am sure that you have all heard of the novel coronavirus, COVID-19, but it's similar to SARS, it's rolling around the world, and it's been extremely interesting to see what the response has been like. Um, we can kind of break the response to the virus by the United States into four stages. So first, the virus was conveyed as being of low risk to Americans. Screening at airports was implemented if they had travelers from affected countries. Second, a task force compromised of different agencies was formed, a public health emergency was declared, and it became clear based on the data from other countries that the effectiveness of a response depended on the testing capabilities of the local entities. Failure to test at a large scale initially kept the data available to the public at a low number. Third, the CDC decided to widen the testing criteria as testing capacity expanded, and the FDA began to issue retroactive approval for non-standard testing. The travel ban was expanded and a supplemental appropriation bill was passed. Fourth, the phase that we are currently in, and it feels like we have been in forever, the declaration of a national emergency and a broadened testing ability that we're starting to try to roll out in all of the states to reveal more accurate numbers of infection. Based on the current situation and response, what can we learn that can be applied to incident response in case of malware attack or a data breach? First, time is of the essence in both responses. The longer it takes to implement a response plan in either situation, the further the infection will potentially spread. Transparency is also extremely important and has been lacking in some of the incident response measures when it comes to a breach or attack. Ensuring that data is up to date, accurate, and widely available will assist not only affected entities, but others that are potentially facing the same attack in the future and trying to secure against it. Adequate resources are another must. Removing any bottlenecks when it comes to testing or detection can shorten the response time and prevent spread of infection. Proper analysis of the agent or the executable is absolutely required in order to determine the cause of the virus, the vectors, and how to mitigate it both in the current moment and in the future. Monitoring is another area where we can definitely improve incident response. There's been so much data available um, mapping and monitoring the spread of COVID-19, and it could be extremely prudent to do the same thing with widespread known malware attacks. And finally, education is paramount. You've seen so many articles and signs and commercials telling people to wash their hands and wear face masks, et cetera, in order to avoid the spread and contraction of this virus. Many security incidents can be avoided by educating the user and making sure that they know the risks and how to avoid an infection or breach. So let's apply what we've learned from pandemic response to a security incident. Here we have COVID, C0V1D, a trojan that is primarily spread through mal spam. This can arrive either via malicious script, macro-enabled document files, or malicious links. COVID will ransack your contact list and send itself to your friends, family, and coworkers, and clients. Since the emails are coming from your hijacked email account, they look less like spam. So the recipients, feeling safe, are more inclined to click bad URLs and download the infected files. If a connected network is present, COVID spreads using a list of common passwords, oftentimes guessing its way onto other connected systems in a brute force attack. And if it continues to spread, it can cause damage worldwide amounting to millions of dollars. So first, let's say your corporation picks up on some suspected COVID infections, the computer version. Let's also say this is a cool, perfect world and there is a World Health Organization but for information security incidents. When a large company detects this infection, they can notify the global reporting authority of the case. The authority tracking all reported cases can gauge at what point there is enough spread to warrant an emergency. While this is happening, researchers can go to work. 
They begin to outline the causes of the infections and how we can potentially remediate these eventually. Think genetic reverse engineering of the COVID virus, you know, the researchers that were trying to develop vaccines and cures. They'll also disseminate this information publicly so users can begin to understand how they can prevent this type of attack from happening to them. Finally, once the spread begins to slow and business returns to normal, the reporting authority can continue to globally monitor the spread of these infections. Oftentimes they recur and it would be helpful to keep track of these spikes and recur resurgences as they occur so they're better handled. So, I mean, the big question is how much time, data, and money could we save by responding to malware like a pandemic? So future implications for communications. Um, I mean, we'd have more effective communication to consumers, resources, better preparation and structure for incident response, mitigation, proper steps and preparedness for remediation and monitoring, global and visual widespread monitoring. And for conclusions, from the first true global pandemics, the need for awareness has become super apparent. If the same easily accessible information was pushed as publicly for malware campaigns, the impact could be lessened and the average user would become more literate in cyber threats as a byproduct. The containment of spread is another lesson that has been learned through the flu pandemic in 1968, the flu pandemic in 1918, and the current COVID-19 pandemic. It became apparent that a main concern is containing the spread of the virus, especially between continents. Once proliferating, it's easy for the number of cases to spread exponentially. We see this in malware also, and it's worth looking at the ways in which we contain the spread of biological viruses and whether these can be applied to mitigation of malware spread. Mutations are extremely common in biological viruses, and this can often be the same in the spread of malware, albeit by intent. The same viruses can come back in different forms, slightly tweaked, or with different execution. We also see repeats very often. Um, by looking at the way the strains of the flu, especially subtypes H2N2 and H3N8, continue to recur, we can draw many parallels among uh, the recurrence of malware. What changes in the world climate cause the same types of malware to be brought out of retirement and how can we potentially track this similarity to the statistical recurrence of biological viruses? There could be great value added in malware and data breach incident response if we further examine the pandemic responses and work as a whole to apply some of the transparencies and data collection methods that are utilized, among other things. And that is everything. So I left plenty of time for different questions. I'm not sure what popped up during the presentation, but. Yeah, there is uh, at least one question. So the first one is, what would you specify as a vaccine in regards to cyber viruses? Biological is very specific to a certain strain, but cyber seems to be broad. Yeah, that is one of the things, although, you know, some of the newer vaccines that they're talking about, some of the RNA-based ones are kind of a little bit broader. You can think of them as they'll target every mutation of a certain type of virus. So some of the ones that are, you know, being investigated for COVID right now will essentially attack any kind of coronavirus. And I think there's actually hope that it'll start to overlap with some of the flu viruses out there as well. Um, so in that regard, it's a little bit more similar, uh, but yeah, definitely, I think that they're, I think you could almost think of it more like a patch in some ways because you're essentially fixing something specific so that you cannot become um you know vulnerable to a certain type of attack or any a certain type of malware anything along those lines so i guess a patch is more similar to a vaccine in in that way than just a general um prevention mechanism 
Awesome. And uh, the next question is from the same person. Do you think there is a barrier in the development of biological vaccines due to the need of over oversight? Unlike cyber, where pretty much anyone can reverse engineer a malicious .exe to find the root cause and potential fix. Absolutely. Um, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. I mean, I've worked on that side of things. I worked in the regulatory side of, um, you know, vaccine development and pharmaceuticals and things like that. So I understand and have seen the benefits of having all of those, you know, phase one through four uh, preclinical, um, you know, the different trials, the different reviews, their safety reviews constantly. Um, I think that's really important because you're talking about human lives here. Um, so yeah, I think there's definitely, I would consider that to be a very big bottleneck compared to, you know, anyone who wants to can take malware and reverse engineer it if they have the skills to, or they can build those skills. Um, most random people should not be reverse engineering viruses and creating vaccines in their homes. If you are, then, I don't know. There might be some people that have a problem with that. Please, please don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like don't, don't tell me. I don't want to know. <laughs> right, right. 